My topic tonight is the value of uh, honeybees to Maine. And to start off, first of all, I'd like you all to take a look at uh, the pinned insects I brought along, just so you get an idea of how many uh, different species of bees and wasps there are just locally. Um, but I want to start off by discussing what is pollination, because that's really what the value of bees is. What is pollination? And pollination is the transfer of pollen from the anther of the flower, which is the male part of the flower, to the stigma, which is the female part of the flower. The pollen will grow a tube, and then the ovum is fertilized. Certain plants are wind pollinated. By far, the majority of plants are wind pollinated, at least the ones that we typically see, such as corn, wheat. Um, and of the roughly 240,000 plants globally, supposedly 75% of them require some sort of pollination. So it can either be a bird, a bat, a beetle, a bee, etc. You've probably all heard the story since uh, 06 bees have gotten a lot of publicity in the media. We went through a similar phenomenon in 1996. And those of you may recall the Honey Nut Cheerio Save the Bee campaign where people were encouraged to clip the bee off of the box of Honey Nut Cheerios, mail it to General Mills, and they would donate 25 cents per cardboard cutout for honeybee research. Point being, there have been problems with bees for several decades now, going on 30 years. The common statement is one third of the bites of food you eat are as a result of bee pollination. Not necessarily honeybees, but bee pollination. And things such as, you know, fruits, blueberries, uh, apples, raspberries, um, you know, those, those are insect pollinated. Pickles, cucumbers, uh, squash, pumpkins, etc. Farmers actually bring the bees in to pollinate the crop. If you really want to stretch it, some people make the case that the meat that is on your table is uh, benefited by bee pollination because bees are actually moved in for clover seed and alfalfa seed production. So you can really stretch this argument, but in general, roughly 90 crops produced in this country um, are pollinated by bees, meaning farmers bring in either honeybees or a different species of bee to do it. Not just bees are pollinators. I mentioned birds, bats, you get the monarch, which we don't see too many of these days. Flower beetles are very common if you pay attention to what's growing. See all the pollen grains in that beetle. Flies. I get tons of samples from people who think they've discovered a new bee, but actually many flies mimic bees. And you can always tell a fly from a bee because flies always have two wings. Bees have four. The other thing about a fly is they have these very short, they call them aristate antennae. They're kind of like hairs. Um, and they tend to have big eyes that touch in front of their heads. But they're very important pollinators. But they're all doing a job. Ants are major pollinators. We were discussing ants before, and they do quite a bit of blueberry pollination that they really don't get credit for. I'm going to focus on the bees. And if you notice in the pinned insects when you get a chance to stretch, um, bees are covered with hair. That's one way to identify a bee, any species. And in North America, there's roughly 3,500 species of bees, globally 20,000. So this is a, a honeybee, which incidentally is an introduced species. I think if in current day, if the honeybee did not exist in North America and uh, someone was trying to import it from Europe or Africa, um, I have a strong suspicion that the federal government would say, no, you cannot import these uh, insects because, number one, they sting. Um, and then also, they're, quote, invasive, which folks who are members of the Merrim Meeting Bay, uh, friends of the Merrim Meeting Bay, can identify with some of those issues. There are basically three um, species of bees that are really the workhorses in US agriculture. The one on the far left is called the uh, leafcutter bee. There are native leaf cutters that are indigenous to Maine. One in particular works uh, blueberries exclusively. It's, uh, the leaf cutters are in the Osmia genus. That one on the left is the alfalfa leaf cutter. They're mass produced uh, in the prairie provinces in Canada and also the Dakotas primarily to pollinate alfalfa because honeybees don't like to work alfalfa. 
because when they do, the anthers of the alfalfa have a trip mechanism and they whack the bee on the head. And after a while, the bee just won't put up with it, so she'll start to work the alfalfa flower from the side, getting a sip of nectar, but not pollinating the plant. These alfalfa leaf cutters will take it on the head every time, and then when they go to the next flower, when they put their head in, they're transferring the pollen. The critter in the middle is the honeybee. Um, there are different races of bees. Uh, the primary race in the U.S. is the Italian, obviously brought in from Italy. There's also a race called the Carniolan, brought in from uh, Carnica, which is an area of the former Yugoslavia. We have Caucasian bees from the Caucasus region, and of course the uh, notorious uh, Africanized bee. So there are different uh, species or races according to what part of uh, the Eastern Hemisphere the bees originated from. There's Egyptian strains, uh, Middle Eastern strains, etc. And of course the bumblebee, which is native to uh, our hemisphere. There have been some introductions and movement of different species of uh, bumblebees from Europe. They've been uh, stopped by the federal government because as we move things into different ecosystems, we don't know what sorts of pathogens, whether they're virus or uh, uh, intestinal parasites that are transmitted. Um, but these bumblebees are mass produced in huge rearing facilities and are you know, commercially available. And I think there's a mass rearing facility on every continent, obviously except Antarctica. The big uh, outfit is Copert International. And another big one is BioQuip. So the leafcutter bees basically uh, snip kind of a circle of leaf and they tend to nest in hollow twigs. And what they'll do is they'll line their gallery with the leaf, they'll provision a pollen ball with a little nectar, she'll lay her egg and then make a leaf partition. So they're all lined up. And in a former life, um, I reared uh, the Japanese hornface bee, which was introduced in the mid-70s from Japan, and we set up gizmos such as this. And you can do this at home if you want to encourage the native leaf cutters. So this is more or less a shelter. It would be affixed to a tree. We would set them usually at this height and somewhere in here, away from animals. Sometimes we put a screen in front to keep the birds out. You can buy these commercially produced uh, cardboard tubes that are kind of coated with a plastic, and you fold them in half, and basically we stuff them on either side. Back when I was working with these bees, the, the tubes weren't available, so I would go out into the uh, marshes and cut Phragmites reeds. And this is really a good way to attract different uh, species of solitary uh, leaf cutting or twig nesting bees. Cut the Phragmites reed below the node, and you, as you notice, you know, the, it's thin on the top and it gets thicker toward the bottom. So therefore you can stuff each side of these tubes with different size diameter reeds, and therefore that'll attract this insect that's specific to that diameter twig or reed in this case. You can also make pegboards. You've probably seen them in gardening magazines where you just drill different holes. Or the pegboards, you've seen them, they kind of look like birdhouses. I think three-eighths of an inch is like the preferred from a quarter to three-eighths. They like that. But again, if you try different hole sizes, you'll attract different sorts of uh, bees. You may also find that a lot of these nests, you'll know when they're provisioned because there'll be a mud cap on the end. And you've got to dissect a few if you're curious, right? And you'll find in, in many instances what you've collected are a species of wasp. And when you break open the, the cavity, you'll find caterpillars or spiders, uh, their prey. Because the difference between bees and wasps, which I didn't mention, the bees are vegetarians. That's why they got the pollen. Uh, the collecting apparatus or the hairy bodies, whereas the wasps tend to be predators. They're meat eaters or carnivores, then there are parasitic uh, species that lay their eggs within other insects, or within the eggs of other insects, or within tree branches, gall wasps, etc. cetera. Um, this is the, the leaf cutter bee. Um, these are the alfalfa leaf cutters, and they were experimented with primarily by the Wyman Company in blueberry pollination. Again, these structures and what's within them are mass produced for the leaf cutter industry out west for alfalfa. And due to some of the problems uh, associated with the bees in the late 80s, the companies were looking at other alternatives just in case, uh, well, they were worried about quarantines. The bees wouldn't be able to cross state lines due to the parasites we were finding. But 
again, they're just looking for other options. Didn't work, and if you want to buy these shelters, I think Wyman's are still trying to sell them. What size, what size How tall are Oh, they're, they're pretty big. They're like a yurt. <laughs> and and uh, on the inside, there's a series, well, this isn't really shown because of the light, but there's a series of these pegboards with thousands of holes. And I don't know if you can see from in the back, but there's like swirls, kind of paint and design so the bees can orient and find that same hole she's working on. They're all females. So unlike the honeybee, which think of as a perennial, honeybees make honey to store so they can eat it in the winter to shiver to generate heat. All the other bee species and wasp species are annuals. They start out with one queen who either provisions a single straw or several straws. She dies, her offspring emerge either the following year or some of the bee species have two cycles in, in our part of the world uh, per generation. There's some nice, uh, near Ed's house, um, a few years back there was an area, I forget the guy's name, he had an area of uh, soil nesting and drenids. And sometimes you'll see they look like wormholes or ant mounds. And watch, there's bees going down there with pollen on their legs and they'll go down four to five feet, some of them. And again, in another former life, I used to pour plaster of Paris down these holes and then excavate the gallery, um, primarily on golf courses. They thought of them as pests. They, they'll never sting, really, the, the solitary bees, unless you hold it or sit on it or, or step on it. Because they have nothing to defend. Like a honeybee is a social insect, right? so they're trying to protect their young and their honey and their hive. The solitary bees, in general, if you go near them, they're going to fly away. On to the bumblebees. Again, these are the major workhorse up in the uh, uh, backyard farms uh, tomato growing facility in Madison. And they're extensively used in the tomato, eggplant, uh, and hothouse like strawberries, uh, especially like in Japan and in Europe. Uh, we also use them on bumblebees because they, or excuse me, blueberries because they do a real good job. And they're sold in quads. So if you open it up, there's a bumblebee nest inside of each, each one. Uh, the, the advantage of the bumblebee, there's fewer of them in there and they'll fly at lower temperatures. They actually work 10 times faster than a honeybee, but you just don't have the numbers. So in a hive that's peaking, such as a bumblebee colony, a hive with 100 to 150 is about as big as they're ever gonna get. And that's typically at the end of the season, July, August, about then they start making the reproductives for the following year. Then this nest literally disintegrates. So I do have a bumblebee nest in this box here and uh, if you find them in the wild, almost always they're in a mouse nest, or mouse hole, chipmunk nest. If you've got an old house with insulation where the mice have gotten in, almost guaranteed when the mice move out, you'll find a bumblebee nest in there. Again, they're annuals. If you can put up with them, they'll be gone, usually for sure by October. Depends on the species. These are reared inside of huge greenhouses, and they get them to basically raise brood and brood up out of sink. So when the farmers in Maine raise them, because during blueberry pollination only the queens are flying around in our climate, they're bringing in these things from greenhouse facilities that are peaking. But remember, even though there's 100 bees in there, only a third of them are flying, because the other bees have to stay home to maintain the brood temperature. Bumblebees keep it at like 85 degrees. So if it's a warm day, more can fly. Just a close up. And uh, there's a couple species they use uh, in Maine. Uh, primarily, I think it's Pennsylvanicus. The interesting thing about bumblebee culture, now they're in cardboard. Um, this is the Pasmaquoddies um, use a lot of bumblebees um, because they're a native bee and they're Native Americans. It's part of their culture. It's kind of neat. They use more bumblebees than any of the other blueberry companies. They still have to put up these electric uh, bear fences to keep the bears out because bears love bumblebee colonies just as much as they like to eat honeybee colonies come spring. Again, their be uh, bears are getting out of hibernation. They're digging these things up, eating the brood, and the bees going for protein. Likewise, in the honeybee hives, they're knocking the boxes of honey off in the spring here, and they're going into the brood chamber and eating brood for protein. In the fall of the year, they tend to eat more honey than brood. Um, so again, it's copert. Get on the internet, you'll see they sell all kinds of uh, biological stuff. Oh. 
So on to the honeybees. And this, again, is the workhorse. Um, when I was hired in 83, we were moving about 11,000 hives into the state. And primarily, they were coming from the eastern seaboard, Georgia, the Carolinas, Virginia, and Florida. The whole situation's changed recently. So he's down there in the brood chamber. Um, the bottom boxes tend to have the queen and the brood, and the upper boxes tends to be where the bees store honey. Just think hollow tree. Bees always put the honey above, because in the winter they move up. That's where the heat is. One of the big crops uh, used in Maine, or where bees are used in Maine, is apples. And unfortunately, the apple industry is kind of well, not kind of, has diminished significantly over the last 30 years. And last year's apple crop was estimated at somewhere around $13 million. Still not small change. I'm talking 2013. We don't know the numbers for 2014 yet. So 13 million, uh, some years, depending upon the market, it'll uh, generate 15 to $16 million. I'm talking farm gate price now. I'm not talking the spin-offs of the people who make the tractors, the ladders, all the infrastructure to keep the industry going. Bees also cheat when they're pollinating apples, and Red Delicious is notorious for the bee cheating. Rather than work the hard way by poking her head through to get a sip of nectar and work those anthers to transfer the pollen, they often will stand on a petal, tip their head sideways, and get a sip of nectar that way. When they play that game, they're not pollinating. Strawberries is another uh, crop that quite a few growers have started to use more and more bees. You can set a strawberry crop without bee pollination, but by putting bees there, there's a more uniform ripening and the fruit size tends to be larger. The more visits a bee makes to a flower, the more seeds are set, therefore it's a plumper, juicier fruit or vegetable and tends to have, from what I've read, a longer shelf life and tends to have more sugars because there's more seeds with that crop. Um, this is a farm I used to pollinate uh, in uh, just north of Belgrade. Can't remember the name of the town, like New Sharon. Just to give you an idea of what's going on, this bee, she's doing it right. She's trying to get a sip of nectar, and by doing so, she's straddling the anthers of the flower. So she's got pollen all over her abdomen. When she moves on to the next one, she's gonna pollinate. So some plants will self-pollinate meaning the individual plant, the pollen can fertilize that ovule. Other plants, such as apples and blueberries, watermelons, cukes, uh, squash, they have to have cross-pollination. The pollen from one flower has to go to another. Within the case of the cucurbits, they have actually a male and a female flower on the same plant. So that pollen has to move from the male flower to the female flower. And then, as I said earlier, a lot of plants are, are wind-pollinated. If potatoes were pollinated by bees, I'd be golden. They, you know, between blueberries and potatoes, but potatoes are grown by tubers or tissue culture. The only bees you'll ever see on potatoes are bumblebees. I've never seen a honeybee on potatoes, and I've walked acres and acres just, just to see it. It doesn't happen. Same situation with eggplants. So here's a poorly pollinated strawberry. Notice you've got good pollination where the seeds have got large, and then here's one that's obviously the, we know the bees were caged in with that cultivar. So growers are spending money on, on strawberries, uh, especially down in Florida and in California, and the trend has been picking up more and more over the years. I know Pops has bees on their property and a lot of the smaller growers. Strawberries, uh, I looked this up, I think they're worth around two point, it surprised me, um, 2.4 million, 2003, the strawberry crop in Maine. And this is only the people who are reporting to the USDA. There's lots of small strawberry acreage that is sold you know, here and there, but this is you know, the more significant acreage. I mentioned the cucurbits. Um, when I moved to Maine in 83, there was a, a thriving uh, squash canning industry through this area of the state up through like, uh, oh, up to Waldeboro. Um, that is crashed, but it's actually coming back again. So we do have a number of squash growers. I couldn't get good numbers on those out of the USDA because if they give you the number, you'll know who it is. I don't know if you've ever read NAS reports, but you can find out for every state um, 
every commodity and as long as it's not specific to like, like say you're in Rhode Island, they're not going to name too many things. They tend to clump that with Connecticut and Massachusetts because you'll know who the farmer is if, if you live in Rhode Island. But uh, in Maine, the pumpkin industry has really taken off. We've got a cucumber industry and the squash. And uh, uh, pumpkins in 03 were worth two million bucks, which really surprised me. And cucumbers, a million dollars. There are other downstate uh, farmers using quite a number of bees and zucchini. I don't know, that, that's not on the list of uh, you know, vegetables that they keep track of. And also I've noticed in the Waldeboro area, farmers are now renting bees in things such as peas and uh, beans, green beans, which I'd never seen until maybe four or five years ago. So bees are being used for a lot more things than we, we typically think of. I should mention the biggest bee user group is the almond industry. And that's what's shaken up the whole industry and kind of, I would say, hastened the spread of various pathogens and parasites throughout North America. Almonds bloom in February. California is number one on the planet. Um, and they're using, it was 900,000. This year they're calling for 1.3 to 1.4 million hives. Well, there's only 2.65 million hives in the United States that again, the USDA keeps track of, and that's anybody with five hives or over, tends to be surveyed. So roughly half of the hives in the United States are picked up and moved either right now or about a month ago and left in vast holding yards in California, or some of our beekeepers from Maine, their bees are now in Georgia and Florida, and they're gonna ship them out to California in February. So that, that's a stress on bees, moving them in the dead of winter. You know, bees need to, kind of go dormant for a while, go broodless, hang out, eat honey, and shiver. If you do have a, a cucumber patch or squash or melons and you're having problems with pollination, um, get out there early in the morning. Between 6, certainly by 11 o'clock, that's when you'll see the bee activity. That's when the flowers are open and receptive. I've gone onto a few farms where they said, hey, we're not getting pollination, only to find that the vast majority of the flowers, for whatever reason, I think it's more environmental, were all males. So they could put all the bees they want on those situations. They're still not gonna have a crop because they're all male flowers. So here's a bee doing her thing. Just to show you the next slide, um, and we could talk about bees for years, but a cool thing about bees is they see ultraviolet light. So According to the scientists, this is what that flower looks like to a bee. And these lines, many flowers have them, they're called nectar guides. And the bees see that UV kind of a single saying right there. That's where the stuff is. That's where the juice is or the pollen. Um, bees, on the other hand, so their visual spectrum is shifted, can't see things like red. Red to them appears to, to be gray. Now how people figure this out, I don't know, but it's gospel. I think it goes back to von Frisch in the 50s. Another big crop, uh, the oil crops, are major bee users, primarily for seed production um, and oil production. In the Dakotas, and even in a rustic, um, we have some uh, sunflower, but out in the Dakotas, tremendous acreage of uh, sunflowers. The bees are moved in for pollination. The beekeepers want them there because it actually makes them sunflower honey. It's a dark, kind of a strong honey. I had the opportunity to work in Alberta a few years back, actually talk to growers and seed companies up there and beekeepers. Their goal in Alberta is to plant a million acres of canola. But the big money is in hybrid seed production, so that's where the bees are brought in. So the, the inbreed lines in North America during the summer, they're shipped down to South America cross-pollinated, so they're getting hybrids, and then they plant rows of these hybrid canolas to get the seed. Production canola pretty much doesn't need bees, but the growers encourage them. They, they produce quite a bit of uh, honey. Um, it's just amazing, because you, know, you go there and it's just yellow as far as you can see. And the interesting thing, again, a little off subject, but all of that canola in Alberta is both GMO and seed treated. And there's a class action suit going on right now in Canada where the beekeepers are suing Syngenta, or maybe Monsanto and Bayer, or maybe all three, 
and the Alberta beekeepers have just pulled out of that lawsuit. They said, we, we don't want to be a part of this because we're making huge honey crops, it's not killing our bees, and we don't want them coming back with airplanes and spraying the old chemistries, the pyrethroids, carbamates, and OPs. So it's kind of a, a weird situation depending upon what part of the world you hear the stories from. So there's a, a poorly pollinated sunflower and excellent. So if you're having problems with pollination, you either need to attract more native pollinators or talk to your neighbor into getting into bees or maybe get a hive or two of your own. Or grow potatoes, right? Bees need diver diversity. And one of the problems going on, at least in this country, is our agriculture is getting bigger and bigger. The, the monocultures are getting more intense and they're cleaner, meaning there's less weeds at the margins of the fields or within the fields. Um, bees love dandelions. And one of the issues we have with apple pollination and even blueberry pollination in the smaller fields in this region of the state, the bees would much rather go to a dandelion than an apple or a blueberry. Blueberries are hard to work. They have to squeeze their head up in that bell and plus they have to fly a little higher. In the spring of the year with the winds, they like to stay low. So depending upon your perspective, I mean, I love dandelions, but a lot of people don't. So there's, there's excellent pollination, I'd have to say. <clears throat> So get on to blueberries. By far the biggest bee user group um, in Maine, and in fact the Maritimes, the blueberry industry is expanding tremendously. I've had opportunity to work in Prince Edward Island, uh, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. I haven't made it to Quebec yet. They're making expansive acres of uh, low bush blueberry there. You've got a blueberry belt right in this part of the state, but if you've never seen the Barrens, it's worth the trip um, if you're into bees and agriculture and just seeing an interesting phenomenon. The blueberry pollination event in Maine is second to the almond event in California, which is nothing. I mean, we've got like 3% of the hives in the U.S. here in Maine for about three to four weeks, but we're second to California, which, so we can brag that up a little bit. Uh, full bloom in a normal year, whatever that is, typically is um, Mother's Day, or no, excuse me, Memorial Day. The bees start rolling in, usually around Mother's Day. So this is the ecology out there. Um, I would say the good thing about it is we're planting or growing a crop that likes acid, lousy soil, rather than trying to grow clover or, or corn out there. Um, you can see out here, are some barrens. The interesting thing about low bush blueberry, if you, you've never encountered them, in general you cut the woods and they sprout up. Remember when I moved up here, I'd worked with blueberries in New Jersey, but they were all cultivated. And our idea of low bush blueberry were the ones like the Weymouth variety that grows this high, and the high bush were like the Jerseys that grew eight, nine feet tall. And I actually broke down one day and pulled over and asked a farmer, I've been looking for blueberries, and I've been here for a month. They, they tell me they're everywhere. I was out on Route 3, you know, in Palermo. And uh, the guy goes, boy, you're standing in them. And I looked down, <laughs> and he says, wow. I did have brown hair, and I was a boy at the time. Um, but again, they're in the same family as cranberries, and low bush blueberries look very much like cranberries in a cranberry bog. I should have mentioned in this picture, you notice the different color. Blueberries are a bi biennial crop. So one year is a production year, the other year is a vegetative growth year. So either the field is burned or the, the way to go now is flail mowing. So they'll mow those plants down to nothing. In the Maritimes of Canada, they double crop. So they'll have two production years, then they flail mow or burn for the off year, and, and then go back into production. And the purpose is, number one, you have higher yields when you alternate the crop, and also so the plant doesn't get too tall and woody. They're much easier to harvest, either by hand or, or machine. So this is what the barrens used to look like. All these trees are gone now. Um, and it used to look like a moonscape. Um, but what's out here, and this is the thing why we need bees for blueberries, all these different kind of hues are clones. And within a given field such as this, I'm told there's like thousands of clones. And in order for a blueberry to set, a bee has to move pollen from one clone to another 
And in general, it takes six visits. One shot doesn't do it to get a nice juicy berry. Often if they only get one visit, the blueberry will drop, such as apples, June drop, because they're not properly fertilized. So they essentially abort. So just to reiterate what I was saying, again, this is kind of still in the rocky terrain and the, the hilly terrain, but it's just, well, maybe this year will be different. It's just been cost prohibitive to blow diesel, you know, out burners. Um, but we'll see. I saw gas for 279 on the way down. It's like, wow. It's like, I went back in time. So here's what it looks like. Get to burn and your production or your bearing field. I also got to add that during blueberry pollination, the weather is typically raw. It's miserable. It's usually cold, drizzly, foggy, windy, not conducive to any bee or animal uh, to be out in, but that's when the, the flowers bloom. This is what the barrens used to look like. It was a moonscape. It's, uh, you know, glacial till. Some of these boulders are, were as big as this room, just about. What's gone on over time is two things. They're picking up the rocks and leveling the land. Therefore, there's more production per acre, and they're also creating more land. So here's some of the rock removal. Some of the big ones, I, th I thought, well, they'll be here forever. Now they're dynamiting them. You know? And there's actually a movement to preserve some of the rocky fields by the geological department up at Orono so they can take the students there to see what the glacial till used to look like before it was turned into a monoculture. So they pick up the rocks. Now there's a job, huh? When I work on Prince Edward Island, one, one day all the machines shut down and I said to the guy, what's going on? He goes, they must have found a rock. I go, what? You know, as if you've ever been there, the sand is red, the rocks are red. So we drive over in, in the truck and Sure enough, they were putting in a cranberry bog and they found a rock. And these men were all fighting over who gets to take the rock home to put in the garden. And I said, I got a deal for you guys. <laughs> so you can see some of the big ones. And as they pick them up, they'll, they'll just stack them up. And then these clumps, they'll put back into the hole. And they have excavators kind of in rows that they kind of scoop back, tamp, tamp, tamp. Scoop back, tamp, tamp, tamp. And the interesting thing is, one company in particular has all women running these big machines. They won't put men in them anymore because the men are too rough and too impatient. And the, the women just go right down the line and they do it right. And, and there's fewer uh, repair bills on these excavators. <laughs> then they bring in the sand. It's like ant hills. Um, sometimes they'll bring in bark mulch. There's been different experiments, uh, wood chips. Um, they're trying to find the best method to get these rhizomes, which is how the blueberries spread, by underground, underground rhizomes, a root system, and they just then poke up berries. The other thing going on is in Washington County and a lot of Hancock County, uh, during the 40s, a lot of the land was put into red pine plantations. So those trees are now mature, they're being harvested, primarily for chipping, biomass, some for lumber. So that area, is being cut and underneath blueberries sprout up. So it's, it's quite an amazing thing that's going on uh, in the state of Maine, the Maritimes, and Ontario at present. Um, it's, you know, you can look at it two ways. I mean, it is habitat destruction, but at least we're not trying to grow something in the desert, the way I look at it. Um, and if the blueberry market gets soft, do nothing, trees will come back, or they could put in the red pine or white pine plantations all over again. Um, like during the 80s, Champion uh, Paper Company would lease land to the blueberry companies, and once they cut over an area, you walk it, you, you do a sprout count, see what the potential is. Because sometimes when you cut, it comes back in all rhodora or azalea, you know, they're like azaleas, or it'll come back in ferns. So you have to really pay attention to where you plan to, to put the money. Um, there is one company right now, a, a new player, that is putting in blueberries in both Maine and Nova Scotia. Um, but primarily it's the blueberry companies. The biggest company, you know, Maine company is Wyman's, but Cherryfield Foods, which is actually a Canadian concern, has far more acreage um, on both sides of the border. And there are independents, of course, like this area in here tends to be 
well, owned by private landowners, which may or may not be managed by the bigger companies. Their tractors, their land leveling, fertilizer, you know, they do all the services. And depending upon the year, you make a profit, or some years you owe the, the company. It's, it's farming. This takes about anywhere from four to six years from cutting the forest to when the first production starts. Again, it depends on the potential of the land. But you notice how slow they do it. You don't want to do it all at once because the land goes into shock. So they'll cut it and they'll leave all the slash and let that set for a year or so. Let things rot. Let, let some biomass get back into the ground. We've seen it done both ways. And I've watched one company in the last three years try to do it all in one fell swoop. It still takes that land about four to six years to produce, maybe even longer, because the ground gets compacted from all the activity going on while they're clearing. So there's somewhat of an art to it. So then, you know, once it's cleared, they'll pick up the stumpage. They typically will burn, um, and it'll come into sprouts. Then often they'll hit it with an herbicide or another burn, and then next thing you know, you've got flowers. Another thing that's going on is they're putting in windrows, which is a good idea to keep the snow from drifting, to prevent winter kill to the buds, um, and also as far as when they're doing a pest control, to keep the sprays within blocks so it's not just blowing around all over the place. But anyway, this is what's happening. The blooms are spectacular. Lately, you get out there and you can just smell blueberry nectar in the barrens. And uh, the thing is, you got all these flowers and unlike apples, which if you pollinate every flower on an apple tree, no matter what, they can't grow all those apples. There's a June drop or in commercial apple industry, they'll thin with either a hormone or an insecticide. Seven is actually an apple thinner too. That way they get big, plump, juicy apples. Whereas with blueberries and almonds, there's a potential for every single flower to become a fruit or a nut. So we bring in the bees. Got the bumblebees, we tried the leaf cutters. As I said, they come rolling in around 1st of May. We had a couple record early years, uh, two years ago, they were coming in mid-April. And logistically, we're bringing in the bees sooner because we're bringing in more bees to pollinate the acreage. We used to use about a half to one hive per acre. Now some of the acreage we're using uh, six to eight hives to the acre. So there's a couple things going on in that account. And the farmers, from his perspective or her perspective, more bees, better pollination, because we have short windows of good weather to get the job done. But if you're a bee or a beekeeper, think of it as putting too many cows in the field. They're gonna get skinny, right? There's just not enough resources. Right, so what it's going to do is invite mice first. You always want to put it on, take a couple steps in. Bees like to live on, they call them ecological transition zones, where it goes from woods to field. So they have their nesting area, and then they have their forage area. It's ugly, but I've seen people throw old furniture. On the, around fields and then the mice move into the cushions and then you see bumblebees coming out of them. So what you're doing is encouraging mouse nests which again got Lyme disease and ticks and all that but the bumblebees like old mouse nests. And there's a whole you get on that you can raise or make nests out of flower pots stuff them with batting or cotton again put them low to the ground perimeters of fields and they'll encourage uh, bumblebee queens to move in. But you're right. So they unload them, they spread them out. We've got two things going on out there. We've got ground bees. So they're set down permanently for that four, three to four week period. Um, again, they're all netted for, for bears. And over time, the, the older bees work farther away from the hive. The young bees work close. Other bees are put on trailers. Roughly, I don't know, we'd have got here, one, two, somewhere around 60, anywhere from 60 to 72 hives to the trailer. And what they'll do with these trailers, as clones come into full bloom, they'll move the trailers in for about a three to five day period and saturate the area with bees who 
are new to the area, so therefore they're going to fly real close to where the trail is removed in. They do this sort of thing in cotton um, down in Texas um, with certain crops. They'll move bees around to kind of confuse them, to make them reorient onto the new area. So this is what kind of action you see when they move that trailer in. I would never allow my bees to be put on trailers because it's tougher on the bees. As you're moving them, depends on the year. If you move them only once, great. But if they move five times during the course of the pollination period, you're losing field bees. Just to let you know, it's all not a rosy picture out there. Some years we have freezes on the bloom. And this past summer or spring, we had one on Township 24, which pretty, pretty much devastated that whole area. And the bees went downhill quick there because again, they're in a monoculture and their only option is red pine, which they can get some pollen from, but it's not a very good pollen. Plus it's a wind pollinated tree, so um, they, they suffered. Come on. One year, we were out there and I was like, I think I see snowflakes. And the guy I'm working with says, you're nuts. Well, it started coming down. And once it got like that, I said, I think we're going to go home. <laughs> and um, this was a record crop that year. It, when we used to put one hive to the acre, even two hives to the acre, the bees would make wild blueberry honey. They don't make blueberry honey anymore because you're putting too many bees out there. However, the beekeepers this year who pollinated, say, the Camden Hope Appleton Air Belt down through Dresden, down this way, their bees came out the best they've seen them in a decade, they tell me, and I was in them. They actually made honey this year, the weather was right, and again, it's not a monoculture. They can go work the dandelions, the wild cherries. Um, there's other things out there for them to work on. The farmers don't like it, because they go out in the blueberry field and they see the bees flying right over, heading for the woods. And I tell them, well, let's come back around one, two, better yet, four in the afternoon when the blueberry plant starts to secrete nectar. Because in the morning, the bees are going for pollen in the outskirts, whether it's dandelions, mostly trees, uh, cherries are blooming at that time of the year. As the temperatures warm, you can see the bees switch. Then they start working the blueberries. And this was the same with highbush blueberry. And I'm constantly arguing with them guys down east because they're out there six in the morning, seven in the morning, the bees aren't flying. It's cold, they're not gonna fly. I tell them, come on out with me eight, nine o'clock at night because it's still light out that time of the year at nine at night. You'll see some real bee activity, but most of them are home, you know, 334. So you, again, like I said earlier on the, the pickles and the cukes and the, your squash, go out there in the morning because if you go in the afternoon, you're not gonna see any bees in, in those cucurbit crops. So anyway, most years things work out and we have huge crops. Last year, uh, well, last year we don't know the price, but the estimate is 95 million pounds plus or minus five. So that was the estimate back in September, October. We really don't know the final number until the surveys uh, take place and they're usually published in, in February. The year prior, in 03, um, it was like an 87 million pound crop worth about, uh, I'll call it 88 million, which was worth around $65 million. So it depends upon the market, the blueberry crop tends to be worth between 60 and 110 million pounds, I mean dollars. That's, again, farm gate, we're not talking tractors, we're not talking all the support industry, processing plants, et cetera, to keep things going. Um, I should also mention that uh, we have a high bush blueberry, kind of a small industry in Maine, but the 2013 estimates on that was one and a half million, and that's all fresh pack. To typically pick your own uh, stands. And raspberries, uh, quite a few bees are used in raspberries. I mentioned strawberries was two, 2.4 million. Raspberries estimate was 0.9 million, or excuse me, 0.9, so almost a million bucks, $900,000. So you can see these things are adding up. And again, this is what is reported what we know about. I know there's, there's a lot more out there. What's the average pounds per acre for looking around here? For blueberries? Yeah. Well, when I moved here, if the growers were getting between 600 and 1,500 pounds per acre, they thought it was great. I mean, they thought they could do no better. As time has gone on because of land management, 
fertility and irrigation in particular and the use of bees, some of the acreage is making consistently 10 to 14,000 pounds per acre. And they're still not satisfied. The limiting factor we think now is water. And the fields that are irrigated, doesn't matter if it's a drought year or not, right before harvest they just pump the water to them because blueberries are sold by the pound. So they fatten them up with water. Um, I would, here's the other uh, thing that I'm told. And again, there's a point of diminishing returns. Each additional colony, so this is from the time when we're using a half a hive to the acre to the current, we've experimented with as many as 10 hives to the acre. There's an increase of roughly 1,000 to 1,500 pounds per acre for each additional hive, provided the weather's good, fertility's good, no pest pressure. But again, you can only go so far. And I, I tell growers, I think six is a nice number as long as there's six strong, healthy hives. Um, because that's hedging their bets, they're, they're cutting costs on paying for pollination, and uh, again, good hives will get the job done. I should, should say that uh, this year growers spent probably, just on the bee rental fees, between eight and nine million dollars, just to rent the bees. So that's before, you know, they harvest the first berry. I should mention, I'm almost done here. Um, well, this is the old way, and there's very, around here they still do it this way, but cherry field food, last year and the year before, did not use one human hand. And that was the trend back in the 80s when we were out there and we saw them picking up the rocks. It's like, what the heck? And the movement was, we're going mechanical. And uh, I've been out there with my son since, and I've said, you know, the day will come, because we were out there when they were spraying. I said, these tractors will have no people in them, They'll all be GPS, and they'll be spraying at night when all the bees are home. Likewise, I think the harvest will eventually come to that. But right now, they're harvesting day and night out on the big barrens because it's completely level, but that's all mechanical. So these are some of the smaller mechanical uh, harvesters produced in Canada, and they're shipped here. Um, and some of the machines come from Canada, and then they work their way east as the, uh, the crop ripens. They finally end up way out in Oh, somewhere on Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia. Some of them will gang out. This one, you see the head on it. It's one head. Some of them will have three heads out. So they're getting a pretty big swath. They are leaving behind about 1,000 pounds per acre of blueberries. And when I was hired, there was this old guy who helped make the barrens called Burley Crane. And he used to really get on the rakers to not drop any berries. He would just go nuts if they dropped a berry. And, we were out there, me and some of the older beekeepers, we walked behind these harvesters just to see what's left behind. It's like, the ground is blue. I said, Burley Crane is rolling in his grave right now. He is, <laughs> definitely. And my question to the researchers is, okay, we got all these mushed blueberries. Does that increase the density of the flowers? Are those seeds gonna germinate into blueberries? Which theoretically they can, but again, they're spread by underground rhizomes. Exactly, yep. You can even get a little one, go to the Ag Trade Show that will hook up to your Cub Cadet riding mower and it has heads in front and it'll fill the flats. So that's the blueberry story. Um, I've got to say we have some cranberries in Maine. Nothing like Massachusetts, Wisconsin, or New Jersey. Um, we've got about 200 growers, a little over 200 acres, a hundred of which are owned by one company. Now be Cherryfield, the second big company is Wyman's. A lot of these cranberries wind up going to uh, things like uh, Tim Hortons donuts um, or some of their, their juice mixes. Um, the cranberry industry is in a tough position. It's had a couple peaks and valleys. They're in a valley again due to overproduction. Um, they're getting like $30 a barrel. Barrels 100 pounds of uh, cranberries. It costs about $30 to $35 to produce them uh, per barrel. So back when everybody was putting in bogs, they were going for 85 to $90 a barrel. But again, it's farming. Is that in Maine? Right there? This is actually New Jersey. I was, I was down to Ocean Spray to give a talk down there on, I forget what, probably bees. <clears throat> anyway, what's going on with the bees? I'm gonna end with this. Um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, 
we've had problems for a number of years and the most recent situation for the last, it's going on three decades. Um, I mentioned the Honey Nut Cheerio campaign. So uh, we've got some old problems that Bill can relate with. American fowl root, it's been around since Aristotle's days. He wrote about it, um, which is a bacterial disease of bees. Pretty much not a big issue these days because most commercial beekeepers use an antibiotics in the hives. Um, when we get antibiotic resistance, which happened about 10 years ago, we have an uptick of this American fowl root disease, which is like the hoof and mouth disease of bees. Not only does it kill the hive, but it's highly contagious. So as the hive is going downhill, the strong hives in the area are stealing the honey out of the disease hive, bringing home the spores. So it's one of those things that not only does it kill the bees, it contaminates the equipment. So we burn the equipment infected with that. Fortunately, we're running like 1%. When I first got into bees, which was many moons ago, I was 14. Um, never heard or never saw this thing. This is a fungal disease called chalk brood. It came into our part of the world, late 60s it's thought, early 70s. Pretty much now you can find it anywhere you look. Some years it's worse than others. Again, these are things we can deal with. We've got bees that have genetic resistance to this or a hygienic behavior. It's not the type of thing that's going to wipe out operations. But there were two big events in the mid-80s. 1984, the tracheal mite came in from Mexico. It's a parasite that lives within the breathing tubes, the trachea of the bee. Bees and insects have spiracles on their sides, holes. They don't have a, they don't breathe through the mouth with lungs. And in those spiracles, there's tracheal tubes that wrap around organs or muscle tissue to provide oxygen gas exchange. So this thing crawls into the thoracic spiracles up in the chest, you know, head, thorax, abdomen, and they reproduce within. And basically, they'll literally clog up inside of the breathing tubes of the bee. The good news is, since the tracheal mite and the honeybee have been with each other for thousands of years, certainly thousands of years in Europe, our bees rapidly developed a resistance. But when that mite came in in 1984, by 85 we were finding it in Maine, by 1988 and 89 we were losing 80 to 90% of the hives in the north. So we went from 4.2 million colonies in the US down to 3.5 million within like two or three years. I mentioned earlier the last census said we now have 2.65 million. It actually plummeted lower than that after It's actually two things. It's, it's called, there's two things going on. But, well, first of all, this is what the tracheal mite does to bees in the north. They, they can't thermoregulate. Bees huddle together, eat honey, and shiver in the winter to maintain heat. Right? They don't hibernate. And what it causes the bees to do is break cluster. They'll come out on a freezing cold but a sunny day and roost on the outside of the hive. Notice all the spotting. That's diarrhea, dysentery, which is also associated with an intestinal parasite. It's called nosema. When you open up these hives, right, they went in the winter with a big cluster full of honey. You open them up in the spring, and basically what, all the bees are dead in front of the hive, and you've got literally a handful that have moved over to the sunny side of the hive, and there's poop all over the place, and there's just as much honey in them in the spring as there was in the fall. As far as the resistance mechanism, the susceptible stocks died out within a short order of time, like a million hives. It's a behavior called allo grooming. The bees will groom the mites off of their hairs. These are microscopic, so the, the mite will land on the hair or it puts its arm out. A young bee walks by, it's called questing behavior. They can smell them, they smell different. They grab that hair, because bees are fuzzy, and then they crawl into the tracheal tube. Some theories are the spiracles of certain races of bees are smaller. I don't know if I buy that. I think it's more the grooming behavior and the nosema factor. When you put the tracheal mite and nosema together, it's a death sentence. But here's the big problem. And I brought some of these just so you can see them in real life. So I've got some of the varroa mites in here, a queen bee, and a worker. 
And the best description I've heard is uh, from a former, my former counterpart from Florida, Jerry Hayes, who has recently jumped ship and gone to work for Monsanto. Um, but he's, he's got a purpose. And, and he's taken a lot of heat. I've seen people boo him and walk out of meetings. But he, he's there for a reason. Um, his analogy is make a fist, put it on your body. That's how big that mite is in comparison. I actually think it's a little bigger. So imagine have four or five of these things, like small turtles, sucking blood out of you while you're an embryo and then as you're an adult. So this is the Varroa mite. The problem with this mite is it's introduced from the Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, that has an equilibrium with it. They have a grooming behavior. They have a shorter life cycle. The mite doesn't wipe out Apis serrana, which is where it co-evolved on. It's jump species to Apis mellifera, our European honeybees. So again, we've got things out of balance. You see it all the time in marine ecosystems where something is introduced. It tends to displace native species or will introduce a new virus. Uh, we see problems with these uh, sea lice and other pathogens in the salmon industry. Um, again, we, we're moving things around the planet. Right or wrong, it's what it is. It's globalism. So not only is it sucking blood off the developing bee, they prefer drones, but they'll do workers, and the adult bee, but it's activating and transmitting or vectoring viruses. And we know of at least 20 viruses in honeybees. Prior to the introduction of this mite, the only virus we saw, and it was rare, it was like a quarter of a percent of the hives inspected, was called sac brood virus. And that's a whole nother topic, right? But viruses that were latent, we, they were in honeybees, but never, they were just there, are now active and, and doing a number on the bees. As I said, there's like 20 of them that we know of. Some people say there could be 30. This picture here, <clears throat> well, kind of shows you what's going on in the pupil stage. So right before, this is the head, thorax, abdomen. This is the capping. So think of this bee in a cocoon like a caterpillar, right? So they enter the cell right before the cocoon is spun, and they literally pierce and suck blood out of it. Here's a healthy bee. Healthy bees, again, nice and fuzzy. Abdomen is longer than the wings at rest. Look at these things. Oral gnarled up with tiny abdomens. You notice the wings. That's not because the mites are biting them. It's actually a virus called deformed wing virus, which can be within the bee if you do some DNA or RNA analysis, you may find the virus, but you may not see the symptoms. You inject the Varroa mite into the equation, and you get this going on. There are other viruses called par paralysis virus, different strains, where the bees will walk out of the hive and just shake, unable to fly. There are others that get into the brains of the bee, um, according to German research I've read. They just get confused, they fly out of the hive, and don't come back. Um, again, there's, there's a variety of things. There are viruses that affect the larval stage, where the larvae will essentially melt down from all the viral particles. They should be pearly white, and they just they mush out. So what we found, for the most part, is if you control the varroa, you don't have the viral symptoms. And believe me, it's a lot easier said than done. But don't despair. We've got guys like Bill Truesdell and Ed Friedman still plugging away, you know, backyard beekeepers. And this is a Richard Duncan up in the Augusta area. Um, you, you can do it, but you've got to manage the mite and other issues. And it can be done organically or with synthetic materials. The problem with the synthetics, they only work for a little while, like antibiotics or insecticides. Um, and eventually, the, the parasite or the pathogen gets resistant. We haven't documented any resistance to the uh, organics, which tend to be acids or thymol-based uh, products. So with that, take a look. Um, thank you for your time. And I think I'm on schedule, almost. Yeah. If you're interested in bees, go to the MSBA website. In the near future, there'll be publishing uh, short course dates 
which are offered through adult education, either through local bee associations or uh, county extension offices. Um, and their mainbeekeeper.org is their website. And usually, right about now, they start getting it together.